Everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here um, to jump back into this appeal that Jennifer Bungeen has filed um, on behalf of Robert Sylvester Kelly in the Eastern District of New York, and um, this appeal is actually being heard. He was on trial in the Eastern District of New York. The appeal is actually heard by the Second Circuit of Appeal. And so yesterday, if you didn't um, catch the video, it was what is called the summary of the case. And that's sort of like your introduction when you're writing a college paper. You're basically telling your reader or your audience what you intend to prove, you know, in your thesis that you're getting ready to write or that they're getting ready to read. And so now she's actually getting ready to get into the argument where she proves her points. And as I was telling you guys yesterday, I don't like doing really, really long videos because it takes a really, really long time to upload the video. So I tried to cut it off at about an hour. And so we still have, uh, let's see, 70, 86 more pages to go. And I think I can read about 30 pages within that hour. And so we'll find a good stopping point and then I'll come back and finish up for you guys. So we're going to kick off with the summary of argument. And uh, let's see. She says in Fitzgerald versus Chrysler Corp. And 116 F3D 225 comma 226-27, which was the case. And I'm not going to read all of that. <laughs> you guys know I usually just read the case number and when it was heard. And so Fitzgerald versus Chrysler Corp was heard in the Seventh Circuit in 1997. Um, Chief Judge Posner cautioned that what a statue that where a statue is broadly worded in order to prevent loopholes from being drilled in it by ingenuous lawyers, there is a danger of it being applied to situations absurdly remote from the concerns of the statue's framer. Such is the case here, where the government misused both the Riketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization statue known as a RICO and the man act in a manner never previously conceived or carried out. So a lot of her foundation is in the fact that they charged this man as a RICO in an attempt to bypass statute of limitations because really the things that they were charging R. Kelly with should have been heard in the state court and the statue of, and it should have been heard within five, I think like five or seven years within the time frame of the act. So for example, um, Stephanie, the chick Stephanie, who said that she met him in 1999, that should have been charged in Chicago, but they only had, you know, like maybe until 2000, five or 2006 to bring charges. And so they missed the opportunity to bring charges in these cases because nobody was filing charges, right? Everybody was happy go lucky until two of his former employees decided they wanted to create this documentary, you know, calling out um, Mr. Kelly and all his bad deeds. And then it was picked up, you know, eventually sold to a production team picked up by Lifetime, and then we had the Surviving Lies docudrama. So she's saying that the government then stepped in at the behoof of the Me Too movement, Time's Up, Believe All Women, and decided to make Mr. Kelly the poster boy 
you know, for everything that's wrong in America, to make him, you know, the person who was out here preying on all these people. And one thing I want, I do want to bring up because I've made this point on social media several times. People love to say, oh, well, he was at the high school, you know, picking up these girls from high schools and everybody knew this. This was popular around the the campus, you know, around the city that he would be at these high schools preying on these girls. Okay, number one, it came out in court, you know, that the only reason he was at the high school and it wasn't high schools, uh, like he was trolling through the city at these high schools, it was a high school, right? And the reason he was at that high school was because his mentor, his music mentor, was the music teacher at that high school. And he would go there to meet with her, to share his music with her, to get feedback from her on songs that he had written. And then word got out around town that R. Kelly, because remember, this is R. Kelly in the 90s where he is in his prime. He is the hottest new R&B artist on the scene. And he is working with Aaliyah. You know, he's made, you know, take helped her career take off so he's well known and so people wanted to meet him they wanted to be around him and so when word got out that he was at these high at this high school then kids from other high schools would come to this school to meet him wasn't nobody trying to hook up wasn't nobody trying to do none of that they just wanted to meet this r&b singer now, of course, there were some, some folks like Tiffany Hawkins and all of them who were trying to get with him, get with him. And then you had Javante um, Cunningham testifying with these fantastical stories about how they used to go to the apartment and there was actually a police officer in the apartment. There was Demetrius Smith in the apartment. All these grown men in this apartment and that they would go up there, be like four or five of them, and they up there, and she claimed they in the room having sex with R. Kelly. Make it make sense, okay? So the point I want to make here before we move on is you have all these stories. About, oh, he was doing this at the high school. He was doing that at the high school. But not one person that was a alleged victim in any of these cases that he faced were from the high school that he was supposedly at picking up people where are all these victims from the high school we have none okay so can we please stop that story about oh he was at the high school because um if there were victims at the high school um, surviving r kelly um the case okay the case that was formed from surviving R. Kelly didn't find any of those victims to come in and say, um, he did this to me at the high school. He prayed on me at the high school and all of this other stuff. So I just thought that was interesting that of all these cases that were brought against him, none of them involved people that he allegedly prayed on at the high school. So back to Jennifer Bonjean. I just want to get that off my chest because I have to explain that to people all the time. So she's talking about them trying to use this RICO. You know, they're reinventing the RICO to circumvent these um, state laws where the statute of limitations has run out. So galvanized by an influential social movement determined to punish centuries of male misbehavior through symbolic prosecutions of high profile men, the government brought a RICO prosecution against the defendant that was absurdly remote from the drafter's intent, stretching the liberal construction clause well beyond the intent of Congress. The government constructed a RICO theory designed not to effectuate the purpose of the RICO statute, but to prosecute the defendant for alleged misdeeds going back decades without pesky statutes of limitations, obstacles, In the end, the government failed to prove the offense of racketeering where evidence of a RICO enterprise was non-existent. The government's evidence failed to show a collective of individuals who shared any common purpose other than to promote defendants' music. 
At best, the government demonstrated that the defendant used unwitting low-level employees so this is the argument okay this is where she's about to lay out her case okay so um number one the government failed to prove defendant guilty of racketeering where the record is devoid of evidence of an enterprise comprised of members who shared a common illegal or fraudulent purpose and where the defendant and the alleged enterprise were indistinct ignoring the distinctly economic legislative history of the RICO statute, the government brought a RICO prosecution against the defendant not to remedy widespread criminal activity of an enterprise, but to punish one man who was, whose alleged crimes could no longer be prosecuted by state and local agencies. Under the guise of the liberal construction clause, the government manufactured an ill-fitting RICO theory that was unsupported by the evidence. To be sure, prosecutors have used RICO in a wide variety of circumstances, but the liberal construction clause is, and she has a quote, um, not an invitation to apply RICO to new purposes that Congress never intended. And this was a case, Reeves versus Ernst and Young, and which was heard in 1989 in its rush to indict public enemy number one of the Me Too movement, the government stretched the statue beyond its limits, applying it under circumstances leagues removed circumstances leagues removed from the statue's purpose accordingly when the time came to prove its rico charge the government failed at the fundamental task of establishing an enterprise to convict the defendant of racketeering the government must prove at a minimum the existence of an enterprise and a related pattern of racketeering activity and this is from title 18 united states code section 1962 c and then um, united states versus bassiano which was heard in the second district let's see united states versus bassiano um, which was heard in the Second Circuit in 2010, citing United States versus Turkey, um, which was heard in 1981, um, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the government and drawing all inferences in its favor, this court must vacate defendants' conviction for racketeering where the government's evidence of a RICO enterprise was insufficient and then she cites another case, United States versus Mejia, which was heard in the Second Circuit in 2008. So then um, she makes her first point, um, A, general legal principles. An enterprise includes any individual partnership, corporation, association, or other legal entity and any union or group of individuals associated, in fact, although not a legal entity. Um, Title 18, United States Code, Section 1961 at 4. Um, the United States Supreme Court has defined a RICO enterprise as a group of persons associated together for a common purpose of engaging in the course of conduct. And then she cites um, a case, Turkit, which was heard in 2009. Um, she says also see Boyle versus United States, which was heard in 2009. No, I'm sorry, Turkit was the person she was quoting. And then she's um, telling us that the information is at Boyle versus United States in 2009. An enterprise is demonstrated by evidence of an ongoing organization, formal or informal, and by evidence that the various associates function as a continuing unit. And that was from First Capital Asset Management Incorporated versus Satinwood Incorporated. 
and that was heard by the Second Circuit in 2004, for an association of individuals to constitute an enterprise, the individuals must share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes. The enterprise's purpose must be common to all of its members. And then she cites um, Stein versus Worldwide Plumbing Supply Incorporated, uh, which was heard in the Eastern District of New York in 2014. Um, see also Crab House of Douglaston versus Newsday, which was heard in the Eastern District of New York in 2011. Um, citing satin wood and then she gives the place where um, the citation was read um, the enterprise is neither the individual defendant nor the pattern of racketeering activity rather it is an entity separate and apart from the pattern of activity in which it engaged the end must be alleged and proved separately. However, there must be a nexus between the enterprise and the racketeering activity that is being conducted. Um, United States versus Indelicato. And that was heard also in the Second Circuit in 1989. So against this legal backdrop and taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the government, the government failed to prove RICO enterprise. Assuming arguendo, the government's evidence was sufficient to establish that the defendant committed various sex offenses between 1994 and 2018. Its evidence did not show that those offenses were committed as part of an enterprise. Exactly. That's what we've been saying all along. So specifically, the government's failure to demonstrate a fraudulent or illegal common purpose of the enterprise distinct from the defendant or his racketeering activities was fatal to his RICO theory, notwithstanding the jury's verdict. Because the jury really didn't know any better, right? So then B, no common purpose to engage in a fraudulent or illegal course of action. In its third superseding indictment, the government alleged inter alia that the defendant, individuals he employed, and members of his entourage constituted a group of individuals associated, in fact, who functioned as a continuing unit for the purpose of promoting defendant's music and brand and to recruit. women and girls in an illegal sexual activity with defendant and to produce porn and CP. Defendant does not dispute that during his 25 year recording career, he maintained a production company that employed dozens of, of people. Defendant's business was no different than other businesses, both in the music industry and elsewhere. Typical of a hugely famous recording artist, defendant employed managers, accountants, engineers, security personnel, drivers, runners, and personal assistants. Assistants. Um, defendant concedes that people on his payroll or in his so-called entourage generally shared a common purpose of promoting his music, but the evidence failed to show that his employees shared a common purpose to recruit women and girls to engage in illegal sexual activity with the defendant or in the production of CP. Out of the gate, this RICO prosecution was suspect where the only person named in the indictment was defendant. While the, gov while the government is under no obligation to indict every member of a RICO enterprise, if the government likes evidence to indict any other member of an alleged enterprise, and she has any in parentheses, it is a good sign that no RICO enterprise exists. The government banded around the buzzwords of a legitimate RICO prosecution, quick to label everyone 
and anyone in defendant's orbit as part of his inner circle, but came up short and act on actual evidence of an inner circle of people who carried out the purpose of the so-called enterprise. Of the 45 government witnesses, only eight former employees testified. None offered testimony establishing personal knowledge of defendants' purported illegal sexual conduct, let alone knowing facilitation of it. Despite repeated references to defendants' inner circle, and she keeps putting that in parentheses, which connotes connotes a small group of individuals close to the leader of a group. The government's enterprise evidence came largely from a handful of low-level employees. These employees were consistent in their account of working for a defendant. They largely just followed rules, some arguably strange but not inherently illegal. They were not privy to defendant's sex life or the details of his relationships. Most importantly, they never agreed to assist or help the defendant engage in any sexual conduct of any kind. Quite the opposite. For example, personal assistants Suzette and Alizette, the sister A, as I call her, because I don't know what the correct pronunciation of her name is, expressed concern about how defendant treated some of his living girlfriends, and both women worked for a defendant for short periods of time. Cheryl might quit her job the very next day after meeting Azriel and observing her interactions with the defendant. The district court makes so much of excuse me, the district court makes much of testimony that employees would sometimes pass defendant's phone number along to women. Not a single employee testified that they ever knowingly provided defendant's phone number to a minor or were asked. The record fails to show that there was an expectation to recruit underage girls or that any employee received a benefit for doing so. Indeed, both Anthony Navarro and Tom Arnold denied ever providing defendant's phone number to underage girls or driving any women who appeared to be minors. In fact, the government's evidence reveals that employees were prohibited from interacting with defendant's girlfriend or talking about his relationship with them. Geronda Pace testified that defendant instructed her to continue to tell people that she was 19 after he learned she was 16. In short, the record is devoid of evidence that the members of the enterprise acted with the common objective of ensuring that defendant engaged in illegal sexual activity. Rather, the evidence showed that whatever illegal sexual activity in which the defendant engaged was concealed from his employees and he took measures to keep his personal life secret. That some employees witnessed concerning or odd conduct by the defendant is not the same as sharing a common purpose to promote his illegal sexual conduct. Almost conceding that evidence of an enterprise was insufficient, the district court held that the government was not required to show a common purpose or illegal or fraudulent activity so long as the persons associated in fact share any, and she has that in um, italics, common purpose including the entirety, entirely legal purpose of promoting defendants music and brand. Not so, as held in Satinwood, for an association of individuals to constitute an enterprise, the individuals must share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes. Um, then Satinwood, Inc., and then she says, see also Kyle, or Carl, Carl, K-A-U-L, versus Intercontinental Exchange, and that was from the Southern District of New York, September 12th, 2022. And then she named several other cases um, that were heard in the Southern District of New York, 
March 20th, 2020. And then um, another um, Eastern District of New York, September 22nd, 2020. And these were um, other cases that cited um, some of the same terminology. So all generally holding that to constitute an enterprise, the association of individuals must share a common purpose to engage in a fraudulent or illegal course of conduct. Thus, for the government to prove an enterprise here, it was required to prove that defendant and all members of the so-called association, in fact, enterprise, came together with the common purpose of recruiting women and girls to engage in illegal activity, not merely the broader purpose of promoting defendants' music or brand. In an instructive case, Moss versus BMO Harris Bank, which was heard in the Eastern District of New York in 2017, the plaintiff brought a punitive a putative class action against First Premier Bank alleging RICO violations. The plaintiff charged that FPB, a formal legal entity, belonged to the Automated Clearinghouse, ACH, um, network, a payment processing system that processed unlawful ACH transactions on behalf of payday lenders. The plaintiff argued the ACH network constituted an enterprise consisting of originators, various um, depository financial institutions that received ACH transaction instructions, ACH operators and third-party service providers, all of which shared the common lawful purpose of facilitating batch processing of electronic payments for and between participating depository financial institutions. The court concluded that the ACH network described by plaintiff did not constitute an enterprise for RICO purposes because it did not share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes. Which was the fatal, which was fatal to its claim. Emphasis in the original citing um, New York versus United Parcel Service, um, 2016, and then she starts naming a bunch of cases here, and then she goes on affirming dismissal of association, in fact, RICO claim, where the amended complaint admitted that. Certain participants in the purported enterprise were not aware of deceptive practices at issue. Let's see, and then she named some more cases. First National Bank versus Gelt Funding Corp, um, Southern District of New York, 1993. And then it was affirmed in the Second Circuit in 1994. Um, Critically, the Moss Court expressly rejected the plaintiff's enterprise theory, finding it implausible that all of the institutions that allegedly made up the enterprise possess the unlawful intent required to transform the cooperative into an association, in fact, enterprise for RICO purposes. So basically what she's saying here, y'all, is uh, one man. Ain't no enterprise. <laughs> no matter how the government um, tried to flip it and turn it, they could not make this an enterprise because none of the employees were aware of the illegal activity that the defendant was trying to um, was trying to perform. So, because they weren't aware, then they can't be a part of the enterprise. So she goes on to, you know, like I said, she's citing a whole bunch of cases to support what she's saying. And then she goes on, um, critically, the Moss Court expressly rejected the plaintiff's enterprise theory, finding it implausible that all of the institutions, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what, okay, if you're just now, if you're new to my channel, 
I have an issue with my Adobe on my computer that when I am scrolling down the page, when I get to the page break, instead of it going to the next page, for some reason, it goes back to the top of the last page. I can't figure out why it does this, but that's what it does. So I do apologize for that. So let's get back on the right page. So um, she was citing all these cases and then she goes to a case, Antil versus Ally Financial. And this was in the Southern District of New York, 2014, affirmed in part, reviewed in part on other grounds. Um, then she goes to Bab versus Capital Source Incorporated. Second Circuit, um, 2015, dismissing RICO claims that alleged that defendants used the mortgage electronic registration system known as MERS to conceal unlawful mortgage transfers because plaintiff failed to show coordinated activity to jointly achieve a common fraudulent purpose. Emphasis in the original. The Moss Court observed that at best, the defendant used a legitimate network to advance its own legitimate business interests and that the alleged illicit ACH transactions did not render, render the ACH, ACH network a RICO enterprise absent a common purpose among the other network participants to violate RICO. So she is laying out her case that this was not a RICO and she's providing, you know, a lot of backup that came out of the circuit, the second circuit, who is hearing this, who's going to um, decide whether or not to hear this case. And she's using their own words, their own rulings as to why this is not a RICO and that this conviction should be thrown out. So the Moss court Logic applies with full force here. The government's evidence showed the best, at best, the defendant used his role within his legitimate music-driven collective to participate in private sexual misconduct. As in Moss, defendant's use of his otherwise legitimate music business to advance his allegedly illegitimate sexual needs does not render defendant business organization a RICO enterprise absent a common purpose among the associates to violate RICO statutes. The defendant's employee shared an abstract purpose of promoting defendant's music and brand does not satisfy the common purpose requirement since there still must exist a, ne exist a nexus between the objective of the enterprise and the racketeering activity. In Delicata, it's plain that the establishment of a RICO violation there must also be some kind of relationship between the acts and the enterprise. For each of the substantive RICO subsections prohibits a specific type of enterprise play be between a pattern of racketeering activity and the enterprise. And then she um, cites Cisneros versus Petland Incorporated, which was heard in the 11th Circuit in 2020, holding that an abstract common purpose, such as a generally shared interest in making money, will not suffice to establish an enterprise. Rather, where the participant's ultimate purpose is to make money for themselves, a RICO plaintiff must plausibly allege that the participants shared the purpose of enriching themselves through a particular criminal course of conduct. See also Ray versus Spirit Airlines, um, heard by the 11th Circuit in 2016, observing that the common purpose of making money would not be sufficient to find an association, in fact, enterprise between Spirit Airlines and outside vendors who merely provided, and then uh, anodyne services, and then Serum versus Mercy and Care Center. Um, these are some other cases that she's citing. Northern District of 
California, January 19, 2022. Um, U.S. Dominion Incorporated, and this is a current case, um, U.S. Dominion Incorporated, which is the people who make the voting machines uh, versus My Pillow Incorporated. Um, DC Circuit, May 19th, 2022. So, you guys, if you are familiar uh, with the whole Donald Trump presidency, the election was stolen saga. U.S. Dominion makes the voting machines, right, that we use when we vote. My Pillow Incorporated is run by this guy who is like Donald Trump, ride or die. Fan, okay, he was there fighting to the end, fighting to the end, lost part of his fortune, okay, supporting Donald Trump's theory that these um, voting machines were rigged for Biden. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you in terms of that election. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that um, Joe Biden won the election, but what them numbers came in, like never in the history of the U.S. have there ever been that many people voting for the presidency. So without a doubt, I know millions of those votes were fraudulent votes, whether they were for Donald Trump or for Joe Biden because it was just unheard of. Like, do you guys realize that there were, let's see, the, I think last count, it was up into like the 66 millions of voters, right? So that meant that on both sides, about 16 million more people for Republicans and for Democrats voted. So 16, six, so like over 30 million people, more people voted in the 2020 election than ever before in previous elections. That was just unheard of. So we know for a fact that there was some shenanigans going on. But in any event, uh, that's who the My Pillow Incorporated is. Is that man that put his life on the line for a friend? Okay. Oh, child. I just thought it was funny that she cited that case. But anyway, let me get back to where I was. Okay, so in this order, the district court claims that Satin Wood is at odds with Turkett because Turkett mentioned nothing about a fraudulent course of conduct, holding only that the individuals in an enterprise must share a common purpose to engage in a course of conduct. A closer look at Turkett strongly suggests that the Supreme Court presumed illegalities in the course of conduct to which it referred. Um, the question presented to the court in Turkett um, did not involve a deep dive into the course of conduct language, but addressed... Whether an enterprise encompasses both legitimate and illegitimate enterprises or is limited to application to the former. Um, Turkett, that came from Turkett. Okay, the court rejected the argument that an entirely illegal organization was outside the purview of the RICO statute or inconsistent with the statute's purpose. The court wrote, on the contrary, these statements of purpose are in full accord with the proposition that RICO is equally applicable to a criminal enterprise that has no legitimate dimension or has yet to acquire one. So, during its discussion, um, Turkett assumed a RICO enterprise would have some criminal objective. The court compared those associations, in fact, that were entirely criminal in nature with those that were a mixed bag of criminality and legitimacy. Turkett never suggested that an enterprise would be established by individuals engaging in a course of conduct with an entirely legal purpose that was unrelated to the alleged racketeering acts of one person in the enterprise. 
The RICO statute was never intended to remedy criminal conduct of individuals who carried out their misdeeds through the use of routine services by their unwitting personal assistants. Under the government and the district court's logic, an entirely rogue actor working in an otherwise entirely legal organization could be prosecuted under RICO for merely duping his assistants or associates into facilitating his misdeeds with mundane tasks. One could think of countless duties acts of an unwitting personal assistant such as making hotel reservations calling an uber throwing out a bag of garbage or delivering a message that could facilitate a criminal perpetuated by i'm sorry a crime perpetrated by an individual working in the context of business that does not a rico enterprise make so she's outlined, and I believe that when she's talking about that Turkic case, that that was what the government used um, to argue against her motion at the Eastern District of New York level. And so she has brought up this other case that is basically saying um, that, you know, one man ain't an enterprise and that you can't be saying that because you know, like on the street level, you can't say that because a drug dealer used a particular Uber, Uber driver to take him to a particular restaurant to meet with other drug dealers who then uh, went to the movie that was at the same location as the meeting was taking place at the restaurant, that you can't involve all these different people or all these different businesses into the RICO to build your case when these people had no knowledge of what that a drug deal was going down that um, these people were meeting at their locations like they didn't provide their locations to facilitate a drug deal they provided their location because it was a business it was open to the public and just because the drug dealer chose to use that location doesn't make them part of their that drug dealers RICO and so that's what she's trying to, um, you know, build a case against to say that just because R. Kelly had employees and his employees were doing these different jobs, like, you know, booking airfare, um, driving people that were coming to visit him from the airport to his house, from the house to the studio, all these different activities in the course of the day of their legitimate jobs as assistants. And as drivers, as security, does not make them part of an enterprise to facilitate any illegal activity that Mr. Kelly may have been participating in if they had no knowledge that he was participating in this illegal activity. Now, if they had known that Azriel was 17, and still turned a blind eye, still didn't say anything, then you could kind of sort of say that they were a part of the illegal behavior, but would it rise to a RICO, even if they knew that Azrael was underage? And so this is um, the case that she's trying to build and explain um, to the Second Circuit. So then it goes on to be, defendant and the enterprise are not distinct. Relatedly, the government's evidence of a RICO enterprise was insufficient because defendant indistinct, the defendant is indistinct from the enterprise. Um, for Section 1962C purposes, the person, and that's in parentheses, person, um, charged with a RICO violation and the alleged enterprise which is also in quotation must be separate and distinct from one another so cedric versus kushner promotions limited versus king which was heard in 2001 um holding that one must and prove the existence of two distinct entities one a person and two an enterprise that is not simply the same person referred to by a different name. Um, the requirement flows from the statutory mandate that a person 
who engaged in a pattern of racketeering activity must be employed by or associated with the enterprise. And then she goes back to Satinwood, um, Second Circuit 2014. And then um, Riverwoods, Chapacua Corporation, uh, Marine Midland Bank versus Marine Midland Bank. Um, Second Circuit, 1994, and just has a long list of cases that she's citing to prove that point. Then she goes on to say an entity cannot simultaneously be the enterprise and the person who conducts its affairs, permitting that would be tantamount to permitting an entity to associate with itself. Let's see. Okay, and then she cites um, Hirsch versus Enright, um, 3rd District, 1984, and McCullough versus Souter when she's making that point about permitting that would be tantamount to permitting an entity to associate with itself. So if, as the government claims, the objective of the enterprise was to promote the defendant and meet his personal needs, including his sexual activities, legal or not, the enterprise had no function unrelated to the defendant. They are one in the same that the government did not and seemingly could not indict a single other member of this enterprise under a RICO theory reflects the absence of an enterprise distinct from defendant since this RICO prosecution is the first of its kind and likely the last of its kind. <laughs> Hopefully so, Bungie. Hopefully so. Um, this court must look to civil RICO cases for guidance. Okay, so in Riverwoods, um, the plaintiff claim that though acts of extortion and mail fraud or through acts of extortion and mail fraud, the defendant, Marine Midland Blank, coerced Riverwoods to restructure loan agreements between Riverwoods and Westchester Federal Savings, later acquired by Marine Midland. Okay, let's see. Um, Riverwoods purchased a property in Newcastle, New York to develop residential condominiums and, and obtained a loan from Westchester Federal Savings for that purpose. Marine Midland later acquired Westchester Federal Savings and inherited the loan agreement. According to Riverwoods, shortly after the acquisition, Marine Midland officers communicated an intent to dishonor the loan. Agreement and engaged in extortive behavior to force Riverwoods to enter into a new loan agreement with terms more favorable to Marine Midland. Okay, let's put a pin there because I'm telling y'all, I have experienced this firsthand. What happened in this case? So I used to work for a bank, for a bank, I used to work for a church. And so the church had all this money they were getting from this bank, right? This community, it was called Community Bank, I think was the name of it. So the pastor of the church was friends with the president of this bank, right? And so he was just loaning the church money, loaning the church money. So the church was almost a million dollars in debt, right, from these loans. And the guy was giving him these loans without, like, doing a credit check, without having capital or anything like that. So the man had a heart attack and died. The president of the bank had a heart attack and died. So the bank was taken over by Republic Bank. And, you know, Republic Bank is a, I think they're nationwide, um, or they may just be here in Florida. So Republic Bank did what this bank did. They started reviewing their records and reviewing the, their loans. And they was like, wait a minute, how has this church got all this money, has been able to borrow all this money without putting up any collateral? 
So, child, they came and told the pastor of the church, like, no, we have to restructure this loan. You got to put the the church up, the youth church, the daycare center. Like, we need some collateral so, to secure this loan. And so instead of going out shopping to see if he could get another bank to give him a loan, he gets in bed with the people that have bought out the community bank. And so basically after he agreed, they had to change the bylaws of the church. And he did this because it benefited him because by creating bylaws, that was one of the things they had to create bylaws for the church. So in creating the bylaws of the church, he made it where he could not be fired. Okay. Like he made it where he couldn't be fired when the, when the, parishioners came in to um, sign off or read the new bylaws. They had to come during church hours. They couldn't take the paperwork with them. They had to go in the conference room and read the documents. Man, it was a mess. Then them people um, showed their behind right, and told him that the church's accountant could not um, certify the quarterly financial statements that he had to hire an outside CPA who would certify the documents. If he was late with the monthly certification, they could foreclose on the, on the loan to the church. And what made all of this so crazy is because our city is being gentrified left and right. Okay. And the church is on prime real estate where the most gentrification is taking place. And I will sit in the meetings like, do not sign these papers. But he signed them anyway, child. But um, mm, 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 mm. it was a mess. Okay. It was a whole entire mess. So I said all that, you know, kind of break down what she's trying to show in this um by citing this particular lawsuit. So we're going to move right along here. So it goes on to say, in its compliant Riverwoods alleged inter Leah that through a pattern of racketeering activity, Marine Midland and two of its loan officers participated in the affairs of an association, in fact, enterprise known as the Restructuring Group in violation of Title 18 United States Code Section 1962C. The Second Circuit reiterated that under the plain language of the statute of the RICO person must conduct the affairs of the RICO enterprise through a pattern of racketeering and that the person and the enterprise referred to must be distinct of each other. The court emphasized that a corporate entity may not be both the RICO person and the RICO enterprise, acknowledging that the distinctness requirement could be satisfied where there is partial overlap between the RICO person and the RICO enterprise, and that a defendant may be a RICO person and one of a number of members of the RICO enterprise. And then she was citing Cullen versus Margiato from 1987. Um, however, by, alle- by alleging a RICO enterprise that consists merely of a corporate defendant associated with its own employees or agents carrying on the regular affairs of defendant, the distinctness requirement may not be circumvented. The Riverwoods Court observed that because a corporation can only function through its employees and agents an act of the an act any act of the corporation can be viewed as an act of such an enterprise um however wait, hold on and the enterprise is in reality no more than the defendant itself Let's see. And then she cites um, Brittingham versus Mobile Corporation, where employees of a corporation associate together to commit a pattern of predicate acts in the course of their employment. And on behalf of the corporation, the employees in association with the corporation do not form an enterprise. 
distinct from the corporation. Hmm. Let's see here. So the Second Circuit reached a similar conclusion in Discon Incorporated, um, New York Next, NY Next Corporation, Second Circuit, 1996. Um, there, Discon Incorporated was a New York corporation whose primary business was to provide removal services to telephone companies. Discon argued that the defendant, NY Next, a holding company that controlled subsidiaries, Miko and NY Tail, collectively the New York Next defendants, conspired with AT&T Technologies to eliminate Discon from the market removal services by defrauding the public. Discon sued the new the NY Next defendants for for civil RICO, alleging that the NY Next group, which consisted of NY Next Miko and NY Tail, were three separate corporate persons that conducted the affairs of the NY Next group enterprise through a number of illegal predicate acts. Okay, the Second Circuit observed that the distinctiveness requirement could not be circumvented by alleging a RICO enterprise that consists merely of a corporate defendant associated with its own employees or agents carrying on the regular affairs. Okay, regular affairs of the defendant relying on Riverwood. The Second Circuit stated that where employees of a corporation associate together to commit a pattern of predicate acts in the course of their employment and on behalf of the corporation, the employees in associated with the corporations do not form an enterprise distinct from the corporation. The court observed that the defendants in Riverwoods, um, NY Next, Miko, and NY Tail operated within a unified corporate structure, and even though they were legally separate entities, the relationship between NY Next, Miko, and NY Tail was not substantially different from that between the loan officers in Riverwoods in comparison to the bank. At okay, and then in both cases, the individual defendants were acting. We're acting within the scope of a single corporate structure guided by a single corporate consciousness. And then she um, says, also see Atkins at Adoranco Bank and Trust, um, Fifth Circuit, 1987, finding no enterprise distinct from the person where the defendant bank is holding company and three employees were not associated in any manner apart from the activities of the bank. So applying the rules of the foregoing case, the government failed to prove an enterprise distinct from the defendant by alleging a RICO enterprise that consists of defendant and his own employees, agents carrying on his affairs, namely promoting his brand, his music, and even assuming arguendo, his sexual needs, the government fails to satisfy the distinctness requirement. Put differently, because the government alleged that defendant employees associated together for no purpose other than to carry out defendant's needs, including his illegal sexual activity, the employees did not form an enterprise distinct from defendant. Defendant and the alleged enterprise were one and the same. In sum, the government's theory of a RICO enterprise was flawed from the start. The government's evidence taken in its best light showed not only that defendant employed a collective of people over his 25 plus year career who promoted his career and his music, they did not share an objective to commit sex crimes against young women and girls. Accordingly, the government failed to prove an enterprise and defendant's racketeering conviction must be 
they came in. Oh, child. So we are going to stop here. OK, because um, then we move into um, section two, which is the government's evidence was insufficient to prove defendant guilty of violating the Mann Act as it related to Azrael. And we will pick up in our next video talking about that. Now, listen, I think she um, made a good case there because in essence, what she's saying is. Say you work for a, a company and this happens all the time with these RICO cases and stuff where it's been proven that the, so if the head of the company was doing something illegal and the people under the company knew that the head of the company was doing something illegal and they continued to participate, then you might have a RICO. But if I'm at my job, and the vice president of the company comes over to me and says, Tracy, I need you to do this, this, and this. Now, he's the head of the company, right? He's signing the paychecks. I'll say, okay. But knowing me, I would go to my manager and be like, okay, he just asked me to do this, this, and this. And I know that this is against company procedure. And my manager says to me, yeah, but he's the vice president, so you probably should go ahead and do it. That doesn't make me a part of his, his RICO if he get charged with the RICO because I work for the company and I'm doing my job as the job was told to me to be done, right? So basically, that's what they're saying about these employees. These people work for R. Kelly Enterprises, RSK Enterprises, and they were doing their jobs as runners, as security guards, as personal assistants. And when they didn't like what the job entailed, they quit, right? Or if they weren't doing their job, they were fired. And over the course, you know, they're trying to build this RICO saying that it was from what, 1994 to 2018 or however long this thing was supposed to have went on. Do you know how many employees, none of these people were with R. Kelly from 1994 to 2018. Do you know how many employees have gone through RSK Enterprises and they couldn't find one person to say, I knew what he was doing was illegal and I agreed to do it knowing that it was illegal. Not one person was able to come forward and say that. So out of all the employees that he's had over, what is that, like two and a half decades? They couldn't find one person to come and say, I knew what he was doing was illegal. And I agreed to go along with it. Therefore, I am a part of his enterprise, that I am the enterprise. Not one person could they find to say that. So, as we've said all along, one man ain't no enterprise. No matter how many ways they tried to flip it and turn it and say that yes, one man can be an enterprise. In terms of a RICO, no. And I think Jennifer Bonjean, um laid that out very well that, you know, that is not the case. And then using the example about the church, now, they could have easily tried to arrest the guy who passed away, the president who passed away, you know, for fraudulent loan activity, I guess. But that doesn't mean that the church, who was the recipient of the loans, it doesn't mean that they were part of an enterprise with him unless the pastor of the church knew that these loans he was getting were fraudulent loans. And then I think you could have like a conspiracy between the two of them and maybe bring legal charges, but it wouldn't have been a RICO. And you definitely can't blame the people who work for the church, who were underwriting the loans, who were receiving the loan payments, who were managing the accounts. I don't think you could even say that they were part of a RICO because legitimately they were processing the loans that the president had approved and signed off of. And the only thing that was odd about the loans was the fact that he wasn't required to go through, a, the church wasn't required to go through a credit check or credit assessment, and they weren't required to 
put up collateral so at worst they could have defaulted and it would have cost the people at the the shareholders of the bank it would have cost them money and they may have had trouble um with the the fdic in having that money insured if they're the ones that buy, I can't remember the FDIC is the ones that back the loans as well, but you guys get what I'm saying. So I think that it's really hard to prove a RICO when you're talking about one person. And it's kind of difficult if you don't have a trail of things that were taking place um, that you can all lump together and show all these different people who had to be a part of what was going on in order for it to be successful and i just don't think that the government proved that so kudos to um jennifer bonjean we're going to end this here and we will pick up next um where we are talking about child miss azrael Whew. go ahead leave your comments below rate the video subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and until the next time i shall talk to you guys later Bye bye